Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology and in this video I'm going through everything you need to know for Cambridge International looking at topic 5 the mitotic cell cycle. So grab yourself pen, paper so you can make notes or make flashcards from the key marking points or if you want to skip all of those stages then you can download mine in the description. Now if you are watching this as soon as it's been uploaded those resources might not be ready yet but they are coming. So sign up to my mailing list. You'll be the first to be notified when they're available. But for now, let's get into all of that key information to really help you understand this topic. So topic five then is mitotic cell cycle and it's split into two parts. And we're beginning with replication and division of nuclei and the cells. So let's have a look at chromosomes to begin with. In eukaryotic organisms, the DNA is stored as chromosomes. And humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, which means there's 46 in total. And you have two copies of every chromosome. And those matching pairs, or the two copies, are known as homologous pairs. And what we mean by homologous, wherever you see homo in biology, that means the same. So a homologous pair of chromosomes are two chromosomes that are the same size. And key is they have exactly the same genes, but they might have different alleles. And that's what we can see here on this diagram. We've got the gene for hair color, but they've got different alleles. This chromosome has straight, this one has curly. And then you've got a selection of other genes. So this is one chromosome, this is another chromosome, because you count chromosomes by how many centromeres there are. So we do have two chromosomes in this image, and they are a homologous pair of chromosomes because they're the same size and they contain the same genes. A bit more then about chromosomes. In eukaryotic organisms, we said they're stored in the nucleus. And in order for that vast amount of DNA to fit in the nucleus, in this linear shape, that's how we describe the shape of the chromosome, it has to be tightly coiled up to fit. And to assist with that, the DNA wraps around proteins called histones. And I always say to think of this like, if you were to try and pack away your hairdryer, if you wrap the cord around the hairdryer handle, it tightly compacts really neatly. And that's the same idea with DNA wrapping around histone proteins. It helps to really tightly compact and coil it up in a neat way so you're not going to damage the DNA. Chromosomes also have a centromere, which we can see here, and that is the pinching part in the middle of a chromosome. And after DNA replication, this is what a chromosome looks like. It's made up of two sister chromatids. Before DNA replication, it looks like a single stick-like structure, and it would still have a centromere in it. But at this point, the role of the centromere is to hold together those two sister chromatids. At the end of the chromosomes, you have what's known as a telomere, and that's a protective cap. And essentially, it's a DNA sequence and its proteins that are right at the end to protect the DNA during cell division. So it's these repetitive short sequences that make the DNA longer, but those sections aren't coding. It is just to protect the coding regions of the DNA. And telomerase is an enzyme that adds bases to the telomeres to help maintain their length. So if you then go on to cell division, in eukaryotic cells, they enter the cell cycle and they can divide by either mitosis or meiosis. Prokaryotic cells divide by binary fission. And viruses do not undergo cell division as they are non-living. So we're going to focus on just mitosis in this video. The cell cycle is all of the stages involved in creating new cells. And it's split into three stages. You have interphase, which is the longest stage by a long way. And it's shown here in gray. So you can see the majority of the cell cycle is interphase. And that is split into G1, S phase and G2. And we'll go through what those are in a minute. You then have M or the nuclear division, which can either be mitosis or meiosis. We're just focusing on mitosis in this video. And then the last stage of the cell cycle is cytokinesis. So these are the three steps. Let's go through each of those in a bit more detail. So interphase, as I said, is the longest stage. G1 is when protein synthesis occurs to make proteins involved in synthesizing organelles. And then all the organelles can replicate. Because if you're gonna split the cell in half, 
you need to make sure both of those new cells that are created have the correct number of organelles. So that's why we have to replicate all the organelles first. The cell is also checked that it's the correct size, has the correct nutrients, growth factors, and that there's no damage to the DNA. And if a cell doesn't pass those checks, then interphase will not continue. S phase is next, and that is the stage where DNA replication occurs. And then the last part of interphase is G2, and this is when the cell continues to grow, so that when it does split, the two cells are the same size as the original cell. It also has energy stores that are increased and the newly replicated DNA is checked for any copying errors. And if any errors are found, those are either corrected or the cell is destroyed to make sure that these mutations aren't going to be replicated in multiple cells. Stem cells is the next part of this topic. And the definition of a stem cell is that it is an undifferentiated cell that can self-renew, which means to continually divide, and it can become specialised. And there are different levels of potency, which means their ability to divide into a number of different types of cells. So totipotent is the most potent, meaning it can differentiate into any type of cell. Then as we go down the list, it becomes less potent, so pluripotent, multipotent, and unipotent. So let's take a look at those terms in a bit more detail. So totipotent stem cells are the cells that can divide and produce any type of cell in the body. And during development, totipotent cells translate only part of the DNA, resulting in cell specialization. Totipotent cells occur only for a limited time in the early mammalian embryos. Pluripotent cells, those are also found in the embryos and can become almost any type of cell. They just can't become the placenta. For this reason, these are the ones that are used for research with the prospect of using them to treat human diseases because you could potentially use these to create any type of cell or tissue except for the placenta. There are issues with this though, as sometimes the treatment doesn't work or because stem cells continually divide they can result in the formation of tumours. Additionally, there is the ethical debate on whether it's right to, first of all, make a therapeutic clone of yourself, because to use these types of stem cells in treating a patient, they would have to be identical DNA to the patient so they don't get rejected. And the only way to do that would be to make a therapeutic clone of themselves. You'd also have to create an embryo and the embryo then gets destroyed. And that can be seen as playing God or murder. Now, in reality, they have actually got advances on this now. And they use something called induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, but that isn't part of the specification. Next, then we go on to multipotent and unipotent stem cells. And these are found in mature mammals. And they can only divide into a limited number of different types. So multipotent stem cells is, for example, the stem cells that you get in bone marrow. And those can only specialise into or differentiate into the types of blood cells. So it's a limited type of different cells they can differentiate into. Unipotent means that it can only differentiate into the same type of cell. So, for example, skin cells can replicate and differentiate into more skin cells. So some potential uses of stem cells then could be in research and also in medicine. So for example, they could be used to repair damaged tissues or the treatment of neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's where there's damage to the neurons in the brain. Or it could be to look and use these stem cells in developmental biology, so for research purposes. Now we did mention that stem cells in theory they could be amazing for treating different diseases. But because they self-renew, they could lead to the formation of tumours. And that takes us on to this concept here of what is a tumour and what is cancer. So mitosis, which we're going to be going on to, is a gene-controlled process. And there are genes that produce proteins that help to initiate and to control when mitosis stops to make sure that new cells are only being replicated when the body needs those new cells. But mutations can occur in these genes that control mitosis. And if a mutation occurs in those genes, 
the proteins that are produced that are meant to control when mitosis starts and stops may not function. And as a result, you have uncontrolled mitosis. And if mitosis is happening uncontrollably, that means you're going to be making new cells when the body didn't need those new cells. And that is what a tumor is. Now, not all tumors are cancerous. If it's cancerous, we call it a malignant tumor. And some properties of malignant tumors compared to the non-cancerous, which are known as benign tumors, is that a malignant tumor has the ability for some of those cells to break off and then spread in the blood, or it could be in the lymphatic system, and then lodge into new tissues in the body and create a secondary tumor. And we call that metastasis. They also can develop their own blood supply. And if they've got their own blood supply, that means they'll have lots of oxygen and glucose being supplied to these cells so they can respire aerobically more rapidly, produce more ATP, and that will mean mitosis can happen even faster. So many cancer treatments, for example, chemotherapy, work by preventing these rapidly dividing cells from entering mitosis. And therefore, that means the tumour can't get any bigger. And the way this works is some of those drugs using chemotherapy will target spindle fibre formation in metaphase, and this prevents mitosis from happening. And we'll have a look at how when we get to the actual stages of mitosis later on in this video. But ultimately, that prevents the cancer cells from dividing further. The downside is, though, it doesn't just affect cancer cells. It affects any fast dividing cells. So that is cells in your body such as hair cells, skin cells, the cells lining your intestine. Those are all fast dividing cells. And this chemotherapy will therefore affect all of those. And that is why chemotherapy has so many really unpleasant and nasty side effects. The next part of topic five then is looking at how the chromosomes behave in mitosis. Or in other words, we're gonna be going through the stages of mitosis. So mitosis is one of the types of nuclear division that occurs in the cell cycle, and it creates two identical diploid cells. And diploid means you have two copies of every chromosome. It's used for growth, tissue repair, and it's also used in asexual reproduction in plants and animals and fungi. There are four key stages. You have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So you still have the cell cycle occurring. So you start with interphase, but then when you enter mitosis, you go through these four stages. And then at the end of the cell cycle, we have cytokinesis. So the way that people often remember this is just thinking about PMATs as an abbreviation, or is it an acronym? I don't know, PMATS, that's the way to remember it. Um, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So I'm gonna talk you through what happens at each stage, and going back to what we said here, how the chromosomes are behaving at each stage. That's the phrase that is used to describe the position of the chromosomes. So prophase is the first step, and this is when chromosomes condense, meaning they coil up really, really tightly, and that means they become visible as individual chromosomes. And in animal cells, the centrioles, which are gonna be responsible for releasing the spindle fiber, those are normally together at one pole of the cell, and instead, they'll start to move apart to the opposite ends or the opposite poles of the cell. The centrioles that create the spindle fibers are released from both poles to start to create this spindle apparatus. And these will then attach to the centromere and the chromatids in the later stages. Plants also have a spindle apparatus, but they lack those centrioles. The next stage is metaphase. And in metaphase, the chromosome's behavior is that they will line up in single file at the equator of the cell. And the equator is the term we use for the middle of the cell. Because it's a sphere, we use the term equator a bit like we do for the Earth. So they align in the center, which is the equator of the cell. And at this point, those spindle fibers that have been released from the centrioles will attach to the centromere and some of the chromatids on those chromosomes. And this again helps them to align at the equator of the cell. 
The spindle assembly checkpoint also occurs at this stage, and this is where there's a check to ensure that every chromosome has attached to a spindle fibre before mitosis can proceed into the next stage, which is anaphase. So in anaphase, this is when those spindle fibres start to shorten and move back towards the centrioles. And as they do that, it pulls the centromere and chromatids and it splits that centromere in half. And that is what results in the chromatids, those sister chromatids, being separated and being pulled towards the opposite poles of the cell. So that's what we've got written just here. Now, this stage does require energy in the form of ATP, which is provided by aerobic respiration in the mitochondria. So this links back to what we were saying in terms of cancer, the fact that malignant tumours have their own blood supply, therefore they get more oxygen and more glucose for aerobic respiration to happen at a faster rate. Therefore, there's more ATP, and that is going to be helping in this stage here, anaphase. But when we talked about the drugs, chemotherapy, affecting that spindle fibre formation, if spindle fibres aren't forming, you're not going to be separating the chromatids, the opposite poles, and therefore you don't end up with two new cells that have the correct number of chromosomes, and those cells would therefore be destroyed. Now, lastly, we've got telophase, and this is when the chromosomes are now at each pole of the cell, and the chromosomes start to become uncondensed, so they get longer and thinner again, and therefore they are starting to become no longer visible as individual chromosomes. The spindle fibre will also start to disintegrate at this point, and we can see that nuclear membrane starts to reform. The final step is the cell cycle. This doesn't count as mitosis, but cytokinesis is the last part of the cell cycle, and this is when the cytoplasm splits into two genetically identical cells. So in animals, you get this cleavage furrow forming in the middle of the cell and the cytoskeleton causes the cell membrane to draw inwards. And that is then what causes the cell to split in two eventually. In plant cells, the cell membrane splits into two new cells due to the fusing of vesicles from the Golgi apparatus. And then the cell wall forms new sections around the membrane to complete the division into two cells. Now, you could be asked to observe mitosis under a microscope. And often this is done with root tips of plants, such as onion and garlic. And that is because at the very tip of those roots, and that's because that is where lots of mitosis is occurring. And therefore, you're more likely to be able to observe mitosis at those points. So a thin slice of those root tip is placed on a microscope slide, broken down with a needle. You'd also often add acid and heat so that you are breaking down the connections between the cell walls. So you get this thin layer when you squash down on that sample. You also add a stain and the heat helps that stain to really stain the chromosome so they become visible. So that's what we've got here. A stain is added to make the chromosome visible and the cover slip is then pushed down on. The pushing down is going to squash that tip so you get a single layer of cells so that the light can pass through and therefore you can observe what is going on in those cells. And you might get something that looks a bit like this. Now, all of these ones here where it just looks like a pinky purple circle, you can't see individual chromosomes in those. And that would mean those cells are in interphase of the cell cycle. And most cells will look like that because interphase is the longest stage of the cell cycle and therefore most cells will be in interphase. But in these two, we can see the chromosomes are visible and it looks like at this point they are lining up along the equator. So those two cells would be in metaphase. And you can work out what's known as the mitotic index. And this is by counting how many cells are visible in your field of view and how many cells are visible that are in the stage of mitosis. And you would then use the formula, the number of cells in mitosis, divided by the total number of cells, to give you a mitotic index, which is essentially an index to give you an idea of the rate or how much mitosis is occurring. So you could do a comparison between different tissues. So that is it for the mitosis topic, topic five for Cambridge International A-Level. Hope you found it helpful. If you did, check out all of my other Cambridge International A-Levels 
And don't forget, I've got the notes linked in the description below.